Hello everyone. I'm here today with Arthur, who's going to be my learner as we talk about a multi-system and a multidisciplinary approach to COVID patients in the intensive care unit. We're going to primarily address the ABC DEF liberation bundle uh, that's been created and forwarded by the Society of Critical Care Medicine, among other societies. We are going to, however, change it a little and add a little for what applies to COVID specifically. You up for it, Arthur? I am. All right, awesome. Um, so to begin with, most important thing for everyone to keep in mind is that high quality ICU care is high quality ICU care. Um, the caveat is that you need ICU resources to make that happen. So keep that in mind. But another really important factor is that the more that we can protocolize our care, the better off our patients are gonna be, okay? So when we talk about ABC DEF, the Society of Critical Care Medicine is talking about assessing pain as step number one, okay? And that's fine, but for COVID, I just wanna add a little bit to that, which is maybe not as much of a pain issue, but I want you to keep in mind cough, and I want you to keep in mind dyspnea, because those may really be sort of the larger pain equivalents in COVID patients. Has that been your experience? It has, very much so. Okay. Anything else you want me to add to that? Those are the key points, um, uh, and just making sure that they are comfortable and that you're going and assessing their pain on a routine basis. Okay, perfect. All right, so our next step, um, we're generally talking about patients that are intubated and sedated already. And we wanna do what we call spontaneous awakening trials and spontaneous breathing trials, and we wanna coordinate them and do them together. So no matter what's going on with your patient, unless their oxygen status will absolutely not tolerate it, we wanna go ahead and do these on a daily basis. So we wanna stop the sedatives that your patient is on completely and let them wake up and get a good exam, right? And if we're able to do that, they're able to have a good exam, then we wanna move into seeing if they're gonna be able to tolerate taking the breathing machine away if they're on the breathing machine. The thing that I wanna to add to this, just to keep in mind from a COVID standpoint, is we're not off the bat, early intubating all of our COVID patients like we thought at the beginning of this pandemic. So keep in mind that our patients may be on high flow nasal cannula. They may be on non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Whatever it is, we always wanna make sure that we're not over oxygenating them, but we are keeping them safe and comfortable. Okay, all right, awesome. So when we get into C, this is where I really wanna add some things for COVID specifically, okay? So when we talk about choice of drugs in ABCDEF, we're talking about the choice of drugs for pain, for sedation, for delirium, and that's great and it's super important to think about. You wanna think about your risk of delirium with any drugs you choose. But you also have to keep in mind with COVID, you have to check your hospital supply. And you can only use what your hospital has, right? Okay, you had a smile. You were thinking something there, what were you thinking? Oh uh, no, we just ran into some sources of drugs that we're using routinely. And so we had to get creative sometimes to make sure that we got the correct amount of sedation, not too much, not too little, even if it's drugs we don't always use. Yeah, yeah. And you have to be checking that on a daily basis to understand what your hospital supplies are uh, in the course of a pandemic. Great point, thank you. Okay, so choice of drugs, still super important. But what I wanna add here is communication, and coordination. And what I want to add that for, for the coordination part, we talk about coordinating our spontaneous awakening trial and our spontaneous breathing trial. But now I want the multidisciplinary team to coordinate with each other because everyone needs to go in the room as many times as needed, but not more, right? And so if your nurse does start her spontaneous awakening trial and you're not there to evaluate the patient, that's going to be a problem. Right? So we need to make sure we're coordinating with everyone else on our care team, right? Okay. And then as far as spontaneous breathing trial, coordinating with our respiratory therapists for doing that. Okay, so coordination is key. But communication, Arthur, tell me about your experience with communicating in an N95 and a positive pressure suit in a patient's room with other people that are in that same getup. What's that been like for you? It's been incredibly difficult, um, especially with the beeping going on, as the patient's breathing, maybe triggering the ventilator. 
um, the noise becomes difficult. Um, you're having to basically shout at each other to make sure you can hear through the N95, through the tapper. Yeah. And so having a clear, concise communication and good closed, uh, closed loop communication becomes even more important than normal. Absolutely, right? We can't read each other's lips anymore behind our N95s. We can't hear each other's tone of voice. We often can't hear each other at all if there's a lot of oxygen going in the room and other machines beeping like you're saying. So we really need to figure out ways to handle this ahead of time. So we wanna do as much planning as we can before we go in the room. We wanna make sure we're taking advantage of whiteboards if we have those in the room. And maybe even coming up with some sign language between members of the team to make sure we can communicate what we need to communicate to keep our patients safe and moving in the right direction. Yeah, anything else you wanna to add to the seat? Uh, one key thing that we've used is having walkie-talkies in the room going back to the nursing station. So if we're in the room and we need something, we don't have to um, get out of our gear and go grab it. Someone can grab it, come to the door with it for us. Absolutely. Walkie-talkies, for sure. Love it. Okay. D. Delirium. I'm going to add a couple things to D. Okay. Um, I want to make sure that we're adding depression. Key part. Anything else you want to add? Uh, this isn't vacated. Ah, oh, yes. That's huge, right? So I feel like decision making in the time of COVID is completely different than any decision making I've made before. And the main reason for that is that things are changing so fast and we don't know all the right answers, right? So how do you make a decision about how to treat a patient that comes in to see you, Arthur? It's really been on a patient by patient discussion and it's changed dramatically from the beginning of the pandemic till now. And so learning what resources you can count on at your facility and what validated resources there are online from the different uh, societies has been invaluable. Right. We need to keep in mind that we don't want to see one preprint of one article online and start making all of our treatment decisions based on that. And we don't want to hear one person who we sort of know say something and then we adopt that way of caring for patients. We want to, as much as possible, use proven guidelines with approved decisions and we want to make sure we're staying on top of that data at all times. Okay. An interesting part of this is social media, right? Social media has been invaluable to me in getting articles and research projects as quickly as possible but there's also a lot of really bad information out there, okay? So decision-making, make sure you have a plan, what resources you trust, what resources you're gonna use, who you're gonna consult, who you're gonna ask, how you're gonna stay in the know as much as possible, right? Um, on the depression side of the house, um, I want you to think of this both with respect to your patients, but also with respect to your peers, right? This disease takes an emotional toll that can be completely overwhelming, right? Our patients crash and get super sick super fast, and when they get better, they get better super slowly. And it's discouraging and it's hard to watch. And it's hard to watch for family members, it's hard to watch for patients, and it's hard to watch for us. So be on the lookout for depression all the time, okay? And then of course, we do assessing, preventing, and managing delirium uh, as best as possible, okay? Um, e, we're down to E, early mobility. The thing that I want to add to early mobility, this is super important, we still want to do this, but I want to add empathy. All of, our our, all of our communication needs to be done with empathy and keeping in mind that this is the worst day in the world for many people uh, if they or a family member uh, is admitted. Uh, so keep that in mind and Think about it every time you have an interaction with someone, whether that's on a phone, whether that's on an iPad, or whether that's in person face-to-face, -face. okay? Um, as far as the early mobility, do you have any tricks for how you've made this successful in COVID? It's been more challenging because of the isolation that has been imposed on all these patients. And so a lot of it comes down to the coordination is every time someone goes into the room, they're working on getting the patients mobile, whether it's flutter kicks in bed, standing them up, or even walking around the room based on what they can do but it's not just down to physical therapy and occupational therapy. It's really the team effort every time someone goes into the room. Yeah, that's a great point. We think about early mobility, having to have a physical therapist around to do that. It's not the case. We can get our patients exercising every time we walk in there, right? Whether it's a doc, a nurse, a physical therapist, an occupational therapist, whoever it is, 
all those people can make interventions to keep our patients moving in the right direction and physically moving in general. Well, okay. Another thing with that is encouraging the patients to auto prone before they get uh, too sick to do it. Yeah, that's a great point. Tell me what you mean by auto proning. Um, early on when they're having the mild oxygen requirement that they lay flat on their stomach for a period of time, we see an improvement in their, in their oxygen oxygenation. Yeah, I think it sounds a lot less scary if you just call it adult tummy time. So adult tummy time up here is what we like to call it. But yeah, absolutely, it's a great point. Um, proning as much as we can get people to prone ahead of time to try to prevent the progression of disease is key. All right, final thing is family. Right? We have a lot to say about family. We'll probably make a whole nother session just about family, right? But there's a few key things that I want you to keep in mind here. When we talk about family, normally we're talking about the patient's family. But now I also want you to think about your whole ICU family. Okay, because everyone is struggling, everyone is working their butt off, everyone is doing the best they can in all ways. Have you had any situations, out there where you've had to have end-of-life conversations with family members over the phone? Uh, unfortunately, frequently. Yeah, tell me what that's been like for you. It's tough. Um, a lot of times in the past, the family's been at the bedside watching the progression of the disease. You're having conversations in person on a daily basis. With this, they're bringing them into the ER, and then they don't see the patient again. And so any knowledge of what's going on is coming from you just by voice. And so having to describe what's going on, describe it in a way that they understand it, and then come to an empathetic discussion of what the next step should be is a challenge that I don't think many of us anticipated before the pandemic. Yeah, it's really, really difficult. It sort of changes everything, right? They don't see the patient there in front of them. They can't really understand what's going on. I feel like for every procedure we do, every treatment we offer, it completely changes the informed consent discussion. Right? And then on the other end of that, keep in mind too, family members often can't see each other either. So we have the wife who's the power of attorney in one house, and we have a son in one house and a daughter in another house, and all these people who would be at the bedside conversing and helping each other through this are all over the country, and you're trying to pull them all together and have super important conversations. Never forget, however hard that is for you, it's a thousand times harder for them. So patience is key there, um, keeping that up. And then ICU family, um, any specific checks or things that you do to look out for your ICU family? Um, just as the patients are isolated from their families, a lot of us and the nurses and docs are also isolated from theirs. Um, their families, if they have their own illness, are often looking for someone else. And so they don't have the support uh, at home that they're used to. Mm -hmm. And so they're doing those daily check-ins and making sure they're doing okay and really making that concentrated effort to make sure that everyone has someone to talk to. Yeah. yeah, and if you do ask enough, you're gonna find people that are sleeping in their car so that they don't have to worry about taking COVID home to their family, right? Or, or worse, there's horrible situations out there that people are living through and still coming to work every day and doing everything they can to save these patients. Okay, so keep in mind, we all need to be asked, we all need to be supported and we all need to make sure we're helping each other make good decisions about taking care of ourselves and saying when enough is enough, okay? So that's our ABC DEF for COVID, Arthur, all right? I want you to keep in mind, high quality ICU care is still high quality ICU care. Use protocols, use your team, think about all your organ systems coming together, optimize everything, keep the family in mind, okay? Thanks so much.